Oh, all right. So um, for most of us here, Professor Ezra Vogel needs no introduction. Um, because we're focused on, and in many cases, living in East Asia, he is one of the world's most eminent scholars on the region. He's written many books on Japan and China, including the critically acclaimed Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China. He's a best-selling author in three languages, uh, English, Chinese, and Japanese, and he's the Henry Ford II Professor of the Social Sciences Emeritus at Harvard University. It's our highest honor to have Professor Professor Vogel speak to us today about some of the themes in his latest book, Jap China and Japan Facing History, um, especially looking at the period from 1895 to recent times when in the beginning, Japan had the upper hand and then gradually the tables turned and, and China came, came to the fore. And then, um, and then we'll be looking at and discussing what might lie ahead in this, this important bilateral relationship. Um, so we're deeply honored, Ezra, to have you speak. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you so much. Uh, one of the joys of being a Harvard professor is you have such wonderful students who end up probably teaching you more than uh, you teach them. But uh, in my early years as a professor, uh, one of the students I had was studying uh, Chinatown uh, and taking pictures of it. Her name is Melinda Liu. And uh, since she graduated, I've been able to keep in touch with her. And when she was a reporter in uh, Taiwan, Beijing, Hong Kong, Washington, and I think I've probably learned more from her than she's taught me. <clears throat> The reason I decided to write this book on China and Japan is that I'm a specialist on both countries. Uh, my <clears throat> early work uh, was in Japan, uh, 1958 to 60, I was there. And I've been able to go to Japan ever since that time and keep up with Japan. And I uh, started going to China, uh, first to Hong Kong in 61, and then to mainland, my first visit was 1973. After 1980, I've been able to go to China at least once a year. I have many Chinese friends, many Japanese friends, and I really do want the two countries uh, to do well. So in 2010, <clears throat> when my book on Deng came out and I was trying to th think what I wanted to write about next, it was just at the time that the Japan and China relations were worst. And my Chinese friends said, um, you ought to study uh, history that uh, to deal with the problem of China, Japan, you have to look at the history. I'm not a historian by profession, but I did spend the next seven years trying to understand the history between the two countries. And that's uh, uh, the background for the way I wrote uh, about this uh, book. Now, um, some of my Chinese friends say, Tian bu pa, di bu pa. Um, I'm not afraid of heaven or earth. I'm just afraid of Americans talking about Chinese problems. So I realized that uh, I'm not an insider, but uh, the Chinese also have a saying of Pang Guang Cha Ching. So sometimes the bystander, you know, uh, can see things more objectively. And I really wanted to contribute to China and Japan getting along better with each other and understanding each other. And I, I thought that if the Chinese write a book, the Japanese will be suspicious. If the Japanese write a book, the Chinese would be specific. And that since I had had the good fortune of having a bestseller about Japan uh, in Japan and a bestseller about China uh, in uh, Ch China, I felt that uh, perhaps I could have some influence. And I had a really responsibility for trying to be as objective as, as I can. Now, in my book, I really start with a history back in 600 uh, when Japan started uh, sending missions to China. And of course, they learned all the elements of basic culture uh, from China, even though they had such a small number of people who had contact with each other. Uh, they learned uh, the written language, uh, 
uh, they learn Confucianism, Buddhism. Uh, they learn how to write uh, dynastic histories. Although they didn't have dynasties, but they used that as a format for think about how to write histories. They used it for urban architecture. Uh, the, the temples that they built uh, in Kyoto uh, were really uh, greatly helped by what they learned from architects from China. Uh, and they learned to lay out the city. The city of Kyoto is modeled on China. Uh, and throughout history, uh, even though the contacts were very small in number, uh, the two countries had uh, a great deal uh, that the Japanese learned from China. And so there's a great deal of overlap in the cultures. But what it, since I can't cover everything today, what I thought I would concentrate on are trying to put the last uh, 130 years in perspective. <clears throat> and uh, I want to talk particularly about uh, a period uh, when the Japanese were on top, as Melinda said. And <clears throat> the, the way I uh, think about the perspective is that up until 1895, uh, China was clearly the leading culture and uh, Japan was learning from China. And suddenly from 1895, up till about 2010, uh, uh, Japan was on top. And since about 2010, uh, they've been going through a new adjustment stage where China is back on top under a different circumstance and a different situation. <clears throat> uh, some of the uh, Chinese uh, say that the Japanese have not learned to say they're sorry. They have not done an adequate job of apologizing in World War II, even though they have had formal apologies from prime ministers, they haven't had the depth of understanding of the horrible things that they did uh, in uh, World War II, uh, in Nanjing and uh, in Shanghai and and uh, and Xuzhou and other uh, plates of China, where they just had devastating uh, impact and. Uh, we know uh, many of the horrible things that the Japanese did. I want to talk about a different side uh, of that relationship. Uh, and that, that is the impact particularly of what Japan had on China from 1895. The Chinese talk about uh, the sense of humiliation. But um, in my mind, the humiliation of losing the opium wars <clears throat> didn't have nearly the impact as the humiliation of losing to the Japanese. Uh, right up until the war broke out in 1894-95, uh, the Chinese thought that uh, if there were a conflict, that China would defeat Japan so easily, so quickly, that Japan uh, would be devastated. And then suddenly this little island, uh, group of four little islands uh, with their army suddenly defeated uh, China. And even when they got to the bargaining table between Li Hongzhang and uh, Ito Hirobumi, uh, the Chinese didn't expect that they were gonna have to uh, bend so much because Japan was still uh, such an upstreak. And the Japanese made it clear that they were gonna to have to bend a lot. And they uh, demanded an enormous amount of money uh, uh, in the, after 1895. So the war was a, an enormous shock uh, to China. And I, I think if you think about the changes in China, uh, they, they, the shock of the Sino-Japanese War, you know, within a few years led to the end of the, the old uh, examination system. Uh, 1911, just a few years later, uh, the dynasty fell. You had the, already in 1898, you had the 100 years of reform. And that kind of impact, uh, the shaking of China uh, was much deeper as a result of the Japanese, unexpected Japanese victory uh, than it had been for the opium wars uh, of the uh, British and French. The remarkable thing is that even though after World War II, the, Jap the Chinese hated Japan so much, after 1895, the Chinese were willing to go to Japan uh, to study and learn. Uh, 
And at the time of the Russo-Japanese War in, in 1905, uh, the Chinese, if anything, were on the side of the Japanese. They were much more sympathetic with Japan and much more willing uh, to go there. Um, the the uh, Chinese say quite properly uh, that the Japanese have not sufficiently said we're sorry. And uh, from the Japanese point of view, uh, since 1895, the, ja the Chinese have not sufficiently said thank you. Uh, because after uh, 1895, they welcomed Chinese to come and study. And uh, just as Japanese had studied in Chang'an uh, during the Soi and Tang, uh, so large numbers of Chinese, far more than Japanese had gone to China, uh, were studying in Japan, some estimates of over 10,000 people. And uh, in the early uh, days after the Sino-Japanese War, Sun Yat-sen uh, went to China, uh, to Japan, and uh, used it as a base for gathering money and friendship. Uh, Kang Yu Wei uh, went there after the failure of the Hundred Days of Reform in 1898. Uh, Liang Qichao uh, went to uh, Japan, and they did some of the creative work from there. But the remarkable thing is that all the way up to about 1931, uh, the Chinese were learning a tremendous amount from Japan in every uh, way. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek had gone to military school in Japan. And in the 1930s, the military top command, most of the generals there uh, had studied in Japan. Uh, one of the favorites I have uh, is Zhang Bai-li. Uh, Zhang Bai-li, uh, in 1906, graduated from the Japanese Military Academy. He not only graduated, he was first in his class of Japanese in 1906. And uh, he became close friends with the Japanese. Uh, and in the 1930s, um, he advised uh, Zhang Kai-shek to have a protracted war. He, could see that the Japanese generals he knew were prepared to invade China, and he felt there was nothing that Japan, the Chinese could do to stop them from that invasion, that Japanese military was too strong, that Chinese were not sufficiently united, and the Japanese would uh, overwhelm the, the troops from China very quickly and establish a base. But he devised the idea of a protected war which uh, he advised Chiang Kai-shek, and uh, felt that after the protracted war, the Japanese would get in so deep that the Chinese would end in the win, uh, win in the end, which is, of course, uh, what happened. Uh, but he was uh, marvelous in the way uh, he had learned to uh, understand the Japanese military and knew them extremely well. Uh, in the literary field, uh, the, ja the Chinese who uh, went to Japan uh, were uh, very prominent in developing modern Chinese literature. Uh, Lu Xun, as, you, as uh, everyone knows, had started out to study medicine in uh, Tohoku University. Uh, and when he got there, decided that to wake China up, uh, he wanted to uh, 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 write literature that would arouse them so that we could re resist uh, and uh, have a better uh, sense of how much they needed to change their habits and ways of thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, his brother uh, also, uh, John, uh, George Warren, uh, was also a famous literary person. Later, Guo Moro, uh had spent about 20 years in Japan uh, and had a Japanese wife, uh, Yodafu, uh, in the, in the 1920s, the modern literary movement in China was uh, largely from those people. Uh, now, not only Chiang Kai-shek had studied and the militarists, uh, but some of the communists. Uh, Zhou Enlai had been a student uh, in uh, Japan, and uh, although he wasn't as successful in Japan as he was in France, and didn't never pass the examination to get into Japanese university. Uh, he was there and was affected. And even the Chinese uh, 
uh, ideas of communism and socialism uh, they uh, learned from Japan. Uh, <clears throat> uh, even the words uh, shawa jui uh, or gongchantan or uh, gongchan jui, all those terminology were translations from the Japanese, uh, the Japanese communist uh, Kawakami Hajime had written and a lot of the uh, modern uh, work in China on communism, socialism, as well as broader thinking uh, had been done uh, from Japanese translations. And uh, there were an estimated uh, by the 19, uh, by the time of this Sino-Russia, uh, the, the, the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, an estimated over 10,000 Chinese students in Japan. Far more students uh, studying abroad in one country than any place else in the world. Uh, and so it was really massive numbers. And it was at the time when the, <clears throat> uh, the exa examination system was ending. Um, and even though they didn't have a very clear idea what kind of life they would pursue in China, uh, they were learning about the West and modernization from Japan. So that had an enormous impact right up to the Japanese uh, war. And um, of course, uh, they didn't have the preparation for welcoming foreign, foreign students the way they did uh, the last few years when so many Chinese have gone abroad. We didn't have systems of uh, foreign policy advisors. We didn't have teachers. We didn't have the support system. Uh, they lived uh, in, mostly in Kanda area and little rooming houses. And a lot of their life was spent with fellow Chinese, but they were learning about Japan and many of them uh, could read and speak very good Japanese. Uh, the a second period when the Chinese were learning uh, so much from uh, Japan uh, came after uh, <clears throat> Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978. Uh, at the end of the war, World War II, uh, the uh, Japanese wanted to keep up relations with China. And they felt that their economy was such that they couldn't produce enough agricultural goods. And th therefore, they needed the agricultural goods from China, and they needed access to the Chinese market. Uh, they were too small to operate by themselves. And they, they were... Uh, the Japanese leaders, were, including Yoshida Shigeru, were quite interested in resuming economic contacts with the Chinese. But it was the United States, John Forster Dulles and others, uh, through the occupation which uh, continued in Japan until 1952, said, no, you can't do that. And American uh, leverage over Japan was so great that Japan could not really establish uh, economic relations with China, even though uh, they wished to. Uh, and in 1971, uh, when Nixon uh, uh, sent Kissinger to China in 1972, uh, the Japanese were furious because America had been reassuring them that uh, they should uh, wait till uh, things got better and they should not support uh, mainland China being the UN member, uh, and they were trying to be uh, well behaved and follow America. Uh, and the, America had even re reassured them they wouldn't uh, form relations with China without their uh, knowledge, and yet they did. I mean, the next uh, first Kissinger and then uh, Nixon uh, went to uh, China, and the Japanese were furious and upset. From the point of view of some of the Japanese businessmen, they were afraid American businessmen were going to rush into the market before them. So they wanted to move very quickly. At the time, the Prime Minister Sato Isaku uh, was uh, not very uh, uh, positive toward his relations with China. And uh, he and the Chinese had terrible relations. Uh, but uh, they brought in a new Prime Minister who was much more willing to move ahead, Tanaka Kakoe. And in order to beat out the Americans, uh, they already normalized relationships in 1972 uh, very quickly uh, after Nixon's visit. It was in 
this, in that summer, already they formed uh, relations. Now, uh, they rushed ahead so quickly that uh, they hadn't really resolved issues like where the consulates would be located, what are the rules for trade and so forth. And it wasn't until 1978 uh, when Deng was beginning to come back uh, to power uh, that uh, China uh, and Japan uh, signed the Treaty of Peace and Friendship that allowed them to develop the kind of uh, relationships uh, that would um, make them able to work together. Um, at that time, there were many uh, Chinese and Japanese who knew each other quite well. Uh, Liao Chengzhi, of course, was the best. And Liao Chengzhi was quite unique. He had uh, gone to uh, China, uh, to Japan as a kid uh, with his father Liao Zhengkai, and had attended schools uh, in Japan. And they lived, it was a well to do family. They lived pretty well uh, in Japan, they even a Japanese maid. Uh, and he became very friendly with uh, Japan. And even though later at Wall City University when he was studying, he had some uh, difficulties with authorities, still he had so many friends. So, and then uh, he, later as a loyal communist, uh, he was uh, even on the Politburo. And he's the only person who's been a member of the Politburo uh, who really knew Japan deeply. And so for many, many years, uh, when Japanese after 1972 began going to China, everybody wanted to see uh, Liao Chongzhi. And he was a wonderful contact. On the Japanese side, the person who became, one person who became foreign minister was Okita Saburo. Okita Saburo uh, uh, was the person who was in charge of the planning agency in 1955 when it was formed. Uh, and had been very key in uh, developing uh, modern planning. And uh, he uh, uh, later uh, worked with the Chinese counterparts uh, and uh, Gu Mu in uh, passing on Jap ideas about Japanese planning. As a young man, he grew up in Manchuria and had many Chinese acquaintances and friends. So even though Japan from 1945 uh, right up until the 1970s had almost no contact, uh, there was just very minimal contact. Still, there were people who in the uh, wartime period had very deep understanding of each other and who could then come back after a long period of absence and play a very key role when China and Japan uh, started uh, uh, their contacts. <clears throat> Deng Xiaoping uh, was very smart, and even though he had been uh, fighting the Japanese in World War II, uh, like Mao, he realized that he needed to work with Japan. Uh, and when he was coming to power in, in 1978, even a few months before the Third Plenum, uh, he took a couple of trips, one to Southeast Asia, uh, and another uh, to uh, Japan. He'd already visited uh, France in 1975, a few years earlier. Um, he didn't uh, visit the United States, but he visited Japan uh, in October 1978. And in Japan, while he was there, uh, he was, visited several factories. Uh, he went to visit uh, Kimitsu, uh, probably the most modern steel plant in the world at the time, uh, which became the model for the Baoshan plant. Uh, he went down to Osaka uh, and met uh, uh, Matsushita Konosuke from uh, Panasonic National uh, and to learn about electronics and to encourage him to uh, establish factories. He also visited Nissan. Nissan is a, was an interesting, uh, company in terms of its connection with China because it grew out of, of the industries that had been in Manchuria before uh, uh, the end of World War II. And uh, so Nissan hadn't been making modern cars, but by the time Deng visited in 78, they were. And uh, Deng was able to visit the uh, Nissan factory at Kimitsu uh, and uh, to see 
uh, modern cars uh, being made with robots. Um, and he also uh, wrote on the Shinkansen. At the time, uh, China had no high-speed rails, uh, but uh, now, of course, as you know, about half the high-speed rails in the world are in China. Uh, but at that time, it was a model. So what he saw in Japan and the connections he made uh, in steel, in automobiles, electronics, uh, high-speed rails, all uh, were very prescient uh, in terms of the kind of industrial aid uh, that Japan would supply over the next few years. And it was quite a remarkable, JETRO, which is the arm of the uh, Ministry of International Trade and Industry in those days, uh, what responded to Chinese requests in the early 1980s if a uh, factory wanted to a certain kind of uh, teaching uh, the, the JETRO would organize teachers to go to China. Uh, I remember in the mid 80s, I was in Guangdong uh, and some of the factories I visited had big signs up in Chinese saying that they were using modern ma Japanese management systems uh, and learning quality control from the Japanese. So the Japanese uh, really played an enormous role in getting industry uh, started and that's why to the Japanese mind, uh, even though they did a lot of horrible things in World War II, uh, the Chinese are not sufficiently appreciative of what uh, they, uh, China had learned uh, in, uh, from Japan in uh, the early 1900s. And, and again, uh, in this period, beginning in 1978, uh, after the third plenum, when reform and opening uh, began, and they began to import so many things uh, from Japan. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, through the 1980s, uh, the relationships went quite well, uh, and uh, attitudes between Japanese and Chinese toward each other were pretty good. Uh, but after the Tiananmen incident of June 4, 1989, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, were concerned about how do you get the youth to be patriotic? And Deng said that they needed patriotic education. And so they began a program to try to treat, to develop patriotic education so that uh, they would be loyal and the students uh, would not be uh, uh, causing uh, disturbances that threatened the, the regime. So uh, as part of this education, they were able to use modern uh, propaganda methods uh, and they hit on movies and the movies on World War II proved very popular and a lot of the commercial firms uh, uh, saw an opportunity to make movies about World War II, uh, even though they uh, <clears throat> were not necessarily directed to do so by the government. So there were a tremendous um, number, as, as all of you in Beijing, I'm sure know, of movies. And when I would visit Beijing, uh, it didn't take many flips of the television uh, to find some World War II movie uh, where the Chinese uh, were fighting the horrible uh, Japanese or little kids had games uh, where they were learning to fight the Japanese. So as a result of this patriotic education campaign in the 90s, the anti-Japanese feelings uh, became uh, much stronger. Uh, and uh, the, the real turning point, however, uh, came in my view, not at that time, uh, but beginning, um, you could start about 19, uh, maybe 2005, because the Chi Chinese were already beginning to anticipate that their economy was gonna pass Japan's and they were beginning to feel that confidence. Uh, and when Japanese soccer teams in 2005 uh, were successful in China, there were already anti-Japanese disturbances uh, among the patriotic youth that they would receive the education uh, from patriotic education. And so the anti-Japanese feelings uh, were quite strong uh, during this period, but then, uh, as the Chinese began to feel confident, they could feel that they were again resuming uh, popular uh, 
uh, support and overtaking Japan and putting Japan in its rightful place. It's not hard to imagine uh, that many Chinese felt that the, the uh, humiliation of the last century was fi finally coming to, to an end. And it's not hard to imagine that some Chinese patriots uh, were quite excited about the fact that they were finally going to show the Japanese who was on top. And so tensions grew uh, very much in this period. Uh, the reason I give 10, 2010 as kind of the, the single turning point is that's the year the World Bank said the size of the Chinese economy had passed Japan. But already in 2008, uh, the Chinese had begun to feel uh, that they were getting ahead uh, because uh, the uh, world, the international financial crisis showed the Western economies were not so strong. Japanese economy had not been doing so well since the bubble uh, burst in 1989. Uh, and uh, in addition, 2008, of course, the Chinese had done a wonderful Olympics, the best Olympics uh, that had been held at that time. And so the Chinese were beginning to feel uh, confident uh, and uh, they began to feel that they should put the Japanese uh, in their place. And so the two, two biggest incidents uh, that occurred 2010, 2012, I think should be seen in the context of China finally getting ahead of Japan and putting Japan down in its place. Uh, in uh, 2010, you had the collision of the ships. In 2012, the sale of the property in, in uh, Gyeongdaeu, what the Japanese call Senkaku, uh, and the Japanese sale uh, of that property to the government, uh, which the Chinese called nationalization. Uh, and uh, so that uh, those tensions uh, became uh, very severe. So that the goodwill that had been built up in the 80s and up until the patriotic education campaign had pretty much been dissipated. Uh, now, let me just say uh, a few uh, words about what we are, what we, where we are now after this 2010 uh, transfer of um, top spot uh, to the Chinese. I, the, the Chinese, I think, by about 2014, felt they didn't want to have to run the risk of uh, uh, collisions with Japan. Uh, they wanted to quiet it, things down. And so they began to try to stabilize uh, relationships after about 2014. And because the Chinese middle class had more money to travel, uh, they, the traveler increase, began to increase. And uh, if I remember correctly, by a year or two ago, there were about 8 million Chinese tourists a year going to uh, Japan. Uh, and when they came back from Japan, uh, you know, they were rather surprised. They, they felt they did not behave like the World War II warriors that they had seen in the movies. Uh, people on the, contract were, uh, on the contrary were uh, quite polite. Uh, the society was well run, peaceful, people were friendly. Uh, and so the, the Japanese were not seen as warriors. So the Chinese opinions toward Japan uh, began to change somewhat. So now you have 20-30% of Chinese who have begun to have a more favorable opinion about Japan. The Japanese, on the other hand, have not uh, changed. They became uh, very upset at the time of those uh, collisions in 2010 uh, and in 2012, uh, the uh, problems of nationalization. So uh, when Chinese still send uh, ships and planes near the Gyeongdaeu, the Senkaku, uh, the Japanese are still upset. And even though they don't have a propaganda department like the Chinese, when they show movies of uh, Chinese uh, throwing stones at uh, Japanese stores in China uh, and in uh, uh, Japanese sh uh, Chinese ships and planes threatening in the area near the Yahudao Senkaku area, uh, they are still very upset. So Japanese opinions are still very cautious. Uh, 
I think relationships are much deeper than between the uh, United States and China right now. The Japanese trading companies have uh, offices in maybe 10 to 12 different plate sites in China, and the Japanese have learned local dialects. Uh, Japanese businessmen can get on a plane in the morning, go to uh, Shanghai or Beijing, uh, have a luncheon meeting uh, and uh, afternoon meeting and go back to Tokyo at night. So the, the context, the understanding, the depth of understanding in Japan is much better. And the Japanese have uh, tried to avoid all the nasty slurs and name calling that American congressmen uh, find so attractive in their own political base. Uh, uh, in the Wuhan uh, uh, incident of, of the flu, uh, the coronavirus, uh, the Japanese sent in sympathy. And uh, that was a so much better way of handling it. So there isn't the hard edge. There's the caution between the relationship. I think uh, they're going to have a few years now uh, when they're going to be a little uneasy. But uh, China is now the military power of the region. Uh, it's the economic power. It's going to have more influence uh, than Japan. So the Japanese are going to be quite cautious and much more polite toward the Chinese than uh, Americans to try to keep this from getting out of hand. Uh, so we're going through now a period of adjustment uh, where China is now on top and the Jap Japanese are learning to accept that and trying to define how they can define their future uh, under the situation uh, with China being on top in this new era. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ezra. That's um... Uh, very perceptive, and, and, and in fact, it, it speaks exactly to a question that I wanted to ask you, and uh, as in my using my moderator's prerogative, I'll just ask you it. Um, you're probably aware, uh, no doubt, that uh, the, there's a trend in Chinese diplomacy now of the so-called wolf warrior diplomats uh, who are, who have taken to Twitter uh, in contrast to previous decades of Chinese diplomacy, they've taken to Twitter in a very Trumpian way. They're very brash. They're very aggressive in their language. Um, but it's mainly targeted at the U.S. And of course, we're, we're, we're familiar with how aggressive Chinese officials can be. But in the past, it's often been targeted at Japan. And so I was very interested when you started talking about the you know, the, the more cautious, more prudent, um, and, and maybe more polite level of discourse between China and Japan now. Okay, I can understand why Japan would think that that's appropriate. On the Chinese side, given how virulent in the past we've seen some of the rhetoric against Japan, what's holding China back? from being very aggressive in its uh, diplomatic rhetoric towards Japan? Well, if, you, if, if I were a leader in China and trying to stir up patriotic feelings, in 2010, I would have yelled at the Japanese. But now that the main competitor is the United States, I would have directed that uh, more uh, at the United States. Uh, in, in a way, they've passed Japan already. It's not a competitor in quite the same way, and it's not the rival. Uh, and, and so a lot of the national uh, nationalist rhetoric, uh, patriotic rhetoric in China, uh, I think now can be redirected uh, toward uh, the United States. And Japan is somewhat off the hook. I think the Japanese are very cautious about this because they feel it could be turned any time again uh, against Japan and the uh, things got going uh, very tough in China and they needed a patriotic uh, enemy that Japan would still be uh, very useful. So they are uh, walking on thin ice and being very careful. <clears throat> uh, but I, I think that it's true that the main tension now that, that China has with other countries 
and the source of their patriotic sentiment to, to support leaders uh, when there could be disagreements on various things inside the country are directed more at the United States than at Japan. So I think Japan feels cautious, but pleased and therefore willing to have more contact. How, unfortunately, we don't have high level leaders in both countries who have a good understanding of each other. There's no Liao Chengzhu in China uh, who has a high level of Japanese familiarity of many Japanese friends. Nakasone and uh, Hu Yaobang tried to form a bit of a personal relationship, but there, there have not been any other leaders who have the kind of personal relationship where they have a deep level of confidence. The uh, Japanese, uh, of course, are much more polite than some of us Americans. They're avoiding uh, calling names. Uh, so it's, I would describe it as kind of an uneasy truce and uh, a careful uh, effort on the part of the Japanese to let, keep relationships from getting uh, much worse. Thank you. And that actually segues very directly into another question that came in from um, Jim Nobles, uh, a member of our, our uh, council and also one of our co-hosts today. He also talked about the on again, off again, up and down relationship between China and Japan and asked whether nationalism was the primary reason for these kind of peaks and valleys. Um, and uh, can the Chinese government harness nationalism once it's sort of, you know, once the toothpaste comes out of the tube, you know, sometimes you can't put it back. Well, usually you cannot put it back. Um, have, has everyone learned that lesson or, or is this still a very big risk? Well, the way I see it is that when you have internal difficulties, you need to push the patriotic button. But I think that's what uh, Deng did uh, in the patriotic education after uh, June 4th. And uh, from my uh, understanding of a lot of uh, China specialists in, in the United States and Europe, uh, there are still many issues in planning and extension of uh, uh, benefits to the whole country and uh, medical care and so forth uh, that the Chinese population is not that comfortable with. And uh, the cleanup uh, that Xi Jinping has attempted uh, to get rid of corruption uh, also, of course, raises tension between those who were uh, accused and those who might be accused uh, against the current uh, leadership. So if the tensions arise, then I, I would think that nationalism would be stronger at that point. I think, I think that, that uh, the, the, the power of nationalism uh, comes uh, not from because of what it was five years ago or 10 years ago, but from uh, the, the leadership that wants to use those national sentiments to try to unify the country. And therefore, I think when tensions arise, uh, that nationalism can be much greater and more worrisome. Thank you. And um, another member, Harold Stjorsen, uh, brought up a really good question. Where, where does Taiwan fit into this? Um, obviously, Taiwan is, is a neurologic issue for the Chinese government on many levels. And one, of course, has been its traditional closeness uh, to Japan, both culturally and, of course, you know, when, it was, uh, when there was a colonial relationship. Um, what about I'm the Taiwan factor? I'm afraid as an academic, it's going to take me several minutes to answer this. Um, <laughs> in 1895, at the end of the Sino-Japanese War, when the Japanese took over Taiwan, they encountered initially quite a bit of resistance. And they sent in General Nogi and others to crack down, and they were tough as hell, and they, they got rid of a lot of people. Uh, and uh, they were, but they established an order and they got control fairly easily so that even though they had a lot of police officers after that time, uh, it was rather quieted down. So it, unlike Korea where nationalism 
It remained much stronger. Taiwan, of course, had not been an independent country. Uh, for many years, it was not even a province. It was just a prefecture. Uh, so it didn't have the cohesion uh, that, say, Korea had in resisting the Japanese occupation. And so after the first few years, uh, the Japanese sent in Goto Shinpei, who was a medical doctor at the time when they were trying to get control over malaria and other uh, tropical diseases. And he was an extremely enlightened leader uh, in Taiwan. And so they, the Japanese sent in a lot of their best bureaucrats to help modernize uh, Taiwan. And they brought in modern banking and modern streets and modern roads and railway. Uh, and uh, the best Taiwanese, uh, like uh, the smartest ones, like Li Denhui, got to go to uh, Japan to universities. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the medical doctors uh, had to graduate, some of them, from Tokyo University. Uh, so they got the elite, you know, like uh, the French got some of the um, colonies, the best people in the colonies who became quite French. So they had a relatively good relationship with Taiwan. And then after 1949, when the nationalists came in, uh, the local people uh, found that, you know, they really had many more Japanese habits and that one of the way of uh, resisting uh, the Guomindang coming down for the local people uh, was to work with the Japanese. And in addition, as the Japanese economy began to take off, wages went up and they needed factories uh, elsewhere with cheaper labor. And they went quickly to Taiwan and uh, textiles and uh, other uh, light, lighter industry. Uh, and so uh, the Japanese connection to those local people uh, uh, resisting uh, the Guomindang uh, was, was quite powerful. And because so many Japanese had been in um, Taiwan in the 1930s, uh, a lot of Japanese businessmen, uh, very familiar with the friends in Taiwan, kept up those relationships uh, later. So from the point of view of mainland China, uh, the links between a local nationalism in Taiwan and the Japanese is very worrisome. And so they're, they're very troubled uh, by those close relationships, which have continued up to today. So, Taiwan is, a, is, I think, a rather special case where colonialism was more accepted and was more concerned with modernizing a place than many of the European uh, uh, colonial uh, efforts in, in Africa. So the, the relationship between uh, Japan and Taiwan is close. And that, of course, is very worrisome when the Taiwan question comes up in Beijing. Thank you. And we've got another um, question from uh, one of our attendees, Taro Mitsuno, who asks, um, Japan started learning about technology and, and even uh, concepts of uh, governance from the West in the 19th century, whereas in earlier times it had been learning from China. What, in today's world, what should China learn from current China? Um, first of all, uh, I think that Japan, even in the Tokugawa period before the Meiji began in 1868, they had Nagasaki open and they were learning from the world in areas like medicine and uh, some armaments and so forth through Nagasaki. Uh, and it was a systematic listening device, uh, unlike anything uh, China had. I think. And Japan realized they were a small place, even in the Tokugawa period. So this habit of, of learning things from the outside and keeping up the outside had been started well before that. But in uh, after the Meiji Restoration, to me, one of the, the greatest um, happenings in terms of modernization of Asia is the Iwakura mission. This is a group of officials from Japan in 1971 who spent 23 months, uh, 21 months uh, traveling around the world 
uh, through the United States, through uh, Western European countries, studying all things. They had been selected before the trip on the basis of their knowledge. Uh, and they went abroad and visited many other places and came back with some comprehensive ideas. And because they had been together on the ships uh, for almost two years, there was a level of common understanding, ability to work with each other, uh, and ability to adapt and, and develop a modernization uh, that was really extraordinary. Now, I think where, where China is today is in a much more complex world. Uh, it had, uh, after 1978, uh, started sending and preparing people abroad. I think uh, their ability to use English is so widespread. It's, it's one of the surprising things to me is how much better English is taught in China than in Japan. Uh, uh, the average uh, high school student in Japan can read some English, but in uh, operating, say, in universities in the United States, there are only a tiny number of Japanese, and even they often have very strong accents. But the, the Chinese have, have really, since 1978, prepared students for studying around the world in all subjects. And when you have now something like 1.1 million Chinese students abroad and 350,000 students in the United States roughly now, uh, and you've already tens and thousands of students from the West uh, who've gone back to Japan, uh, to China. Uh, I think that China has done an extraordinary job of learning from the outside. Of course, Japan in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, was still learning a lot from the West. Uh, although by the late 80s, there was a lot of confidence in Japan that they were already catching up. I think now uh, that many of the Chinese are being the field, they're, they're getting close to being at the Western levels. Uh, but there are so many Chinese abroad uh, that they are learning a lot. I think the key issue now is not whether there are people in China who understand what's going on, but how do you use those people? How do you organize those people to be effective? Uh, the political situation in China is such that many of the people at the very top are not those who've studied abroad uh, and who have not had that much contact. So you have a situation where the big top political decisions are made by people uh, who have much less sense, much less personal feel of what's going on around the world than many of the younger people. So <laughs> uh, my advice to China would be to have some of those political leaders or uh, learn more about the outside world or to let more of those people who have deep knowledge and understanding of the outside world to have higher positions within China. So I think it's not the absence of people who are uh, up to international standards. It's, it's the use of those people and the organization in, in an effective way uh, that deals with the outside world. Thank you so much. And we've got two questions which are somewhat linked, uh, so I'll ask them together. Uh, one is rather specific from Meg Maggio, talking about inward immigration into Japan, um, where the numbers of Hong Kong and mainland Chinese have been increasing. Uh, the question is, will the pandemic halt this inward influx of um, outsiders into Japan? And it, it segues with a larger question um, from uh, one of our members, Rongwu, who asks, what role does Japan's domestic politics play in shaping the bilateral relationship with China? Um, I'm an academic, not a fortune teller. And I can describe some of the conditions that will affect the immigration. Uh, but I find it very hard to predict with any kind of precision uh, what will happen. It depends on so many uh, unknown factors and how the coronavirus uh, is, gets under control worldwide and so forth. But I think the general situation in terms of Japanese and immigration is that the, at the lower level workers uh, are in short supply and 
Japan. If you get something like uh, finding enough uh, workers uh, for the old people's uh, uh, homes, uh, the residences for senior citizens and for uh, medical technicians and so forth, uh, they don't have, you know, the, the rural, there are only about two or three rural, uh, percent of the population is rural now, so you don't have the supply of rural migrants into the cities to fill many of those low-level service jobs. And uh, Japanese businessmen, of course, would be very happy uh, in those sectors uh, if they could import more Filipinos and Hong Kong and Chinese and so forth uh, into Japan. And I think that pressure will be there. Um, there are still other people who feel that Japan has solved its social problems because it is uh, so homogeneous. And that if you let too many outsiders in, uh, that would cause problems. Um, the Japanese uh, are you know, quite, in, in that way, quite nationalistic. I mean, they, if you see the reactions to Koreans now, uh, in Japan, it's, it's uh, always been a problem. Uh, but uh, it's not as easy for outside immigrants to uh, learn Japanese and be welcome uh, in Japan. So I, I, my guess is that immigration will increase now because the Japanese are, need that kind of labor supply, uh, but that uh, it will not be easy. Now remind me, the second question was, uh, simply uh, the role of domestic uh, Japanese politics yeah. in uh, in the bilateral relationship. Um, I don't think there has been that much difference on China policy among uh, different uh, groups. There are certain politicians, uh, Nikaido, who uh, uh, Nikai Nikai San, who uh, is able to take uh, groups of uh, Japanese uh, to China. Uh, in the early period from 1945 uh, up till Tanaka Kakoe and um, normalized relations with China, uh, the closer friendships with China were socialists and communists. So in that period, there was quite a sharp difference uh, between the leftists in Japan <laughs> but once uh, Tanaka Kakoe uh, formed relations with China, the socialists and the left-wing liberal uh, democratic party uh, who were close to China felt they had been done in. Uh, China was uh, uh, seeing Tanaka Kakoe and all those uh, mainline uh, LDP members uh, and uh, no longer leaded uh, the socialists uh, and the communists as their allies within uh, the um, Japanese political system. So I, I think at that, since that time, uh, once that uh, the mainstream under Tanaka Kakue 72 uh, began to form relations with China, uh, it hasn't been uh, a very big uh, political issue. There have, uh, it's not a major split. Uh, the rather funny thing was that um, the opposition, uh, the, uh, when Hatoyama Yukio came to power, the socialist power for a very brief time, he thought of forming much better relations with China and his first visit abroad was to uh, Beijing. Uh, and he formed quite good relations uh, with China. But just then the relations between China and Japan became much worse. So among this little group of um, socialists uh, who uh, had wanted to have better relations with uh, China, uh, the paradox was uh, that their relationships became much worse. And I think that the main relationships with uh, China since that time uh, have been uh, on the LDP. And my own view is that to have good stable relations, you have to have the dominant power in, 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 uh, who are patriotic and prove they're patriotic. So uh, Hatoyama, who uh, did not have strong domestic support from the conservatives, uh, rushes to Beijing and wants to be friendly. Uh, 
but it doesn't work. But Abe, by having uh, local support and being patriotic, he visited Yaskuni Shrine uh, before he became prime minister, and it's clear that he is a local patriot. Then he can gradually pull the country toward better relationship with China. And I think uh, that's the kind of political base that allows for a more stable relationship uh, between the countries. So that if you have now uh, Abe as a strong uh, patriot who begins to have better relationship with China, then that's a very strong basis. I think Deng Xiaoping, uh, by, after 1978, by having such strong support, uh, was able to have that kind of relationship. And it, it's my hope that if Xi Jinping, uh, after November now, is able to visit uh, Japan, that he will have that same kind of relationship. Uh, as you know, he was planning to go uh, when the cherry blossoms bloom this spring, but because of the coronavirus, he wasn't able to. Now the question is, when will that visit take place? And if it takes place, I think he clearly has enough domestic uh, commitment and patriotism uh, that uh, I think he has that kind of base that if he forms a good working relationship with Japan, I think it's, it has the potential to put it on a fairly stable basis. Thank you. And, and of course, um, uh, Xi Jinping's visit to Japan will be watched very carefully in, in another city, which is Washington, D.C. And we have a question here from Joe Mosher, who asks about um, the impact of the loosening bonds between America and its Asian allies. What impact does that have on China-Japan relations? Well, Japan uh, is in a very awkward situation. Uh, there's no way they can have a military now to manage China. China's military, uh, they may have a very good training in individual technology and discipline uh, that in some cases may be better than the Chinese. But in terms of overall uh, uh, expenditures for military and the size of military uh, and high technology investment, there's no way they can keep up with China. So that I think in terms of the military, we can expect uh, the, the Japanese to feel much more secure if they keep a strong American commitment. But during the Trump era, when the, so many Japanese doubt uh, what kind of uh, leadership they're gonna have from Washington, and with the scuttling of TPP that they had worked so hard on, uh, I think the Japanese feel that, that a lot of things they have to be a little more independent about. Ever since the occupation, the Japanese have been the little brother to America and pretty much accepted American advice. And they haven't acted as a major independent uh, leader uh, in the world organizations. I think Japan is now trying to begin to reach out a little more independently to India uh, and to have relations with China and Europe uh, and to move ahead with what is left of TPP without the United States. But they haven't had the uh, mentality of, of a leader country. Uh, they haven't trained uh, many people who can speak out in international circles. Uh, they are accustomed to talking with each other and and uh, so involved in domestic politics. They haven't had many world statesmen. Maybe Nakasone might have been one, uh, maybe Yoshida Shigeru in an early period, but uh, <clears throat> they, because America has been so strong and they've been so weak, they haven't trained those. So that I think you're going to see now is that Japan very cautiously begin to try to uh, hedge their bets by having a lot more independence because they're not sure how much they can rely on the United States. But in the military security area, I think they're going to try to keep very strong relations with the United States and not let that uh, go into an area uh, that can be questioned. Thank you. And um, I think we're going to try to squeeze maybe two more quick questions in there. One from Alan Babington-Smith. 
will Chinese leaders ever be able to tolerate um, visits by Japanese officials to Yasukuni Shrine? I don't think so. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, I think that uh, Yasukuni has somehow become such a uh, symbol for uh, militarism that even though the Japanese say, and for many people, I think it really is true, that they're going there to express appreciation for Japanese who've been willing to sacrifice for their country. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're so patriotic. It's true that the museum in Yasukuni Shrine is extremely nationalistic in, in the content, uh, and that uh, Americans who visit there are very upset. Uh, also, not just Chinese. Uh, but uh, if, if Japan were able to get rid of that uh, museum and the um, uh, Japanese continued to make it clear, it's possible that China would not make so much of the Yasukuni Shrine. But I'm afraid that has become such a symbol of Japanese militarism. Uh, the fact that Class A war criminals from Dutch class A war criminals from the uh, uh, <clears throat> occupation period, uh, judge at the occupation trials, uh, are their souls are interred there. Uh, I think the Chinese cannot give that up. If the Japanese should be able to have those war criminals uh, located elsewhere, maybe there's a modest chance. But uh, I think the chances of all those things falling in place are very slim. Thank you. And uh, one final question then um, from Jahan de Biolle. Uh, what would China-Japan relations be like today if America had not used atomic bombs against Japan and um, the USA had not become so powerful? Kind of a question about al almost alternative history here, but um, it touches on many of the themes that you've been talking about? Um, I haven't thought that much about that question uh, <laughs> because uh, I, I sort of took the atomic bomb as, you know, that happened and so what, what does history happen? If, if the United States had not used the atomic bomb, uh, first of all, the war would have dragged on a bit longer. Uh, but um, I think the, the uh, uh, occupation was an allied occupation. It was the largest occupation in world history and the most comprehensive where you try to bring in outside uh, ways of doing things, ways of thinking, democratic thinking. I think the reason it succeeded so much is that there had been a strong democratic base in the 1920s that didn't win out uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, but there, there already was a very strong part. So that um, it wasn't as if the occupation, the outsiders forced um, democracy to come in. I think it, it, there had been a base there uh, and the uh, occupation firmed that up, the atomic bomb and the decisive victory which finally got them to surrender. And the strong occupation uh, gave them, uh, those who wanted a more democratic system, uh, <clears throat> a firm support for moving that direction. So they didn't have quite the angst and the tension that the process of a more authoritarian country becomes democratic. In a way it was, um, as one book uh, titled, forced to be free. Uh, and uh, the, the Japanese therefore, who wanted to become more democratic because of the occupation and pressure from the outside, uh, got over that hurdle without as much internal turmoil as might occur in other countries that make a transition from an authoritarian to a democratic system. Thank you so much. That's a very, that was a very perceptive analysis. Um, and I'm afraid we'll have to uh, start winding things up now. Regrets to everyone who, who had asked questions that we didn't quite get to. Um, 
Ezra, thank you so, so much. We're, we're very honored that you would take the time to talk with us. And uh, the, my pleasure. Just, my pleasure. <laughs> the scope of your expertise and your energy is just a total inspiration. Um, so thank you. And uh, we're good, for one minute, we'll hear from um, Alec, Alan Babington Smith, the president of the yeah, RISD. I'd like to hear feedback too. Melinda, if you give me some feedback what you hear from some of the others who listen today, I'd be, I'd be very interested in their reactions and their thoughts. Yes, I will, absolutely. Um, we, can, we can certainly do that. Uh, we often get a lot of chat and stuff on WeChat and, and uh, reactions, so we, I can definitely pass that on to you. Um, and uh, so, um, Alan, shall, uh, do, would you like to talk for like one minute <laughs> about um, the World Asiatic Society Beijing? Thanks very much indeed, and thank you, Ezra, for a wonderful talk. I may make a personal observation. You're equally marvelous at talking about Sino-Japanese relations as you are about making pancakes. Both of them. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, my name is Alan Babington Smith. I'm the president of the Royal Asiatic Society, of Beijing, and I'd just like to give you a bit of a heads up about some of the events we've got coming up, um, just to show the variety of what we're offering. Uh, the next talk on June the 17th will be about Turandot, Puccini's opera set in China, famously performed in the Forbidden City in just over 20 years ago. And we have Professor Giuseppe Cuccia, who is an Italian opera expert, talking about that opera and about Western opera in China generally. Uh, then uh, in 10 days time, at the weekend of June the 19th to 21st, the trip to the wild wall with the Lindsay family. We have in fact just had yesterday a cancellation. So there is one spare space if anyone would like to join it. It's a unique opportunity to spend time with one of the world's greatest experts on the, on the Great Wall in a very convivial and lively atmosphere. Uh, then to bring us back down to earth, on June the 24th, Michael Humphreys, who is, uh, has spent most of his career as a respiratory physician in China and Hong Kong, is going to be talking about contagion and China and how COVID might come to an end. And then equally changing tack, on July the 1st, Terry Townsend, who is our favorite naturalist, great bird watcher, great naturalist in every sense, uh, has been in uh, Beijing during the coronavirus time. And he will be talking about how Beijing and China generally are rewilding now that so many people, animals have been left on their own without people. So that's what we've got coming up immediately. We have other talks planned through July and August, and we hope you'll all join them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Ezra. Thanks to all the attendees. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, this concludes our presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you. Thanks, Ezra. It was fantastic.